Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk. Uh, we'll tell you our story uh, of our journey migrating in three volumes to proper CSI once. So uh, we'll start by a, a quick reminder about how storage works in Kubernetes, uh, then what's the CSI migration and how we made it work for us. Um, so uh, I'm Antoine, I'm a senior software engineer at Datalog. I joined the company uh, six years ago and uh, it's been two years now that I work on our Kubernetes stack and today I'm with... Hi, I'm Baptiste, a uh, software engineer at Datalog where I do everything related to storage inside Kubernetes. And first, let me give you a brief introduction of uh, how storage works inside Kubernetes. Um, well, in, if you want to have access to some kind of persistent data inside Kubernetes, the most basic way is to use um, what's called like the node per local disk through, for instance, an MTD or um, uh, an host pass. But if you want access to more uh, advanced storage, uh, a pod can create what's called a PVC, Persistent Volume Claim, which is the, the way for the pod to ask access to some kind of volume with a certain size. And the storage class, which is the, the way of the, for the pod to define what kind of uh, volume it wants. For instance, here, the pod can ask for uh, GP3 volumes in AWS EBS. And the cluster will try to satisfy this claim using a persistent volume, which is the way of, for Kubernetes to represent the backing disk used by a pod, which can, be a multiple, which, which can use multiple kind of volume providers, like AWS EBS or GCP persistent disks. And once we have a PV and a PVC, they can be bound together, and the pod can have access to the underlying data. Initially, in Kubernetes, the, the way to get persistent volumes was through in tree volumes. In tree, because the code responsible for creating those volumes inside Kubernetes was part of the in tree Kubernetes uh, source code. So it was the historical way of getting volumes inside Kubernetes. But it had several drawbacks because of the fact that it's inside of the Kubernetes source code. Mainly, um, storage drivers would have to open source their code inside Kubernetes and follow the release cycle of Kubernetes, which is a bit cumbersome when you just want to make some small changes to your driver. And how entry volumes worked was, well, you have a, a pod that can ask for a PVC. And the controller manager, in particular the volume controller, will watch for those PVCs. And once it notices one, it will invoke, uh, like uh, it will call the volume provider to create a disk inside the volume provider. Once the disk is created, the volume controller can create an entry PV and link it to the volume provider disk. And after that, it will bind the PVC created by the pod to the entry PV. Finally, the kubelet present on, uh, on the node where the pod is running will mount the volume inside the pod so that the, the pod can access it. And after entry, there was a, a need to actually create a more versatile a way to get persistent volumes inside Kubernetes. And so uh, CSI was created. CSI stands for Container Storage Interface, which was introduced in 1.9 in Kubernetes and has been GA since 1.13. And CSI uh, creates a way to, for volume providers to have a, um, a common interface to create volumes inside Kubernetes. And it gets rid of the main drawback of uh, in-tree volumes, meaning that the CSI is maintained out of tree from Kubernetes. So each volume provider can have their own driver and maintain it at, at their own pace. Also, CSI brings a bunch of new features to the volume management type Kubernetes. Mainly, uh, you can have access to volume snapshotting, volume cloning, or volume resizing. And CSI works in a very similar way compared to Intree. 
except that you have CSI components deployed in your cluster, so the CSI node or CSI driver, and those components will take care of managing the volumes in place of the kubelet and controller manager. So the core Kubernetes components just become some kind of pass-through for the CSI components. And now we have two kinds of volumes available inside the clusters, Intri and CSI. There was a need to get rid of the old Intri volumes. And so uh, here comes the CSI migration, which is a, a migration activated using a, a feature flag inside the API server and the kubelet, which has been GA since 125. And when you activate this migration, the entry volumes are now, are now managed by CSI the same way as the CSI volumes are. So it, initially, you have entry PVs managed by the controller manager and the kubelet. And once you activate the feature flag, you get still entry PVs, but they are now managed by CSI nodes and CSI driver. So it's, it looks like a, a great migration, right? So yeah, uh, this far it looked easy. Uh, you have official migration, just a couple of flags to, to switch on. But uh, after going through the process, uh, we looked at our cluster <clears throat> and uh, we think that maybe we might have uh, misunderstood uh, the migration term here. Uh, we were still left with uh, volumes that were still in tree. Uh, so they had extra annotation indicating that uh, migration happened, but uh, they were still referencing the in tree driver in the spec and still uh, using the old storage classes. So was it a big deal? Well, maybe uh, <clears throat> it, could, uh, it could have been fine, but uh, we wanted to use the new uh, CSI features. And uh, the new CSI features were working fine with the CSI volumes, but with the migrated ones, it was failing. So uh, we looked uh, at GitHub issues, and uh, we found that it was not a bug. It was a deliberate choice. Uh, CSI migration was uh, never intended to support uh, new features for uh, entry drivers. <clears throat> so uh, this also meant that any uh, new feature uh, in the future wouldn't be supported by those volumes. So uh, it was a prime for us because we had a, a bunch of uh, volumes already provisioned, so it would uh, turn our platform into a very uh, heterogeneous state. And uh, we would have to deal differently with uh, legacy volumes and the, and the new ones. So we could uh, imagine recreating all the volumes by hand, but we couldn't uh, afford to have this kind of uh, disruptive uh, operations uh, involving application teams, uh, especially at our scale. So <clears throat> we needed to, uh, to have a, a true migration feeding our scale. So I mentioned our scale. What is our scale exactly? So uh, at Datadog, uh, we have self-managed clusters uh, running on three different cloud providers. Uh, we run uh, so, uh, <clears throat> hundreds of different clusters. It's, uh, it represents 10 or 1,000 of nodes, and uh, our biggest cluster can have uh, up to 4 southern nodes. <clears throat> uh, for the stateful part, uh, we have a thousands of stateful cells running, and they are owned by a dozen of uh, different teams. It represents hundreds of different services and uh, 10 or 1,000 of uh, persistent volumes. <clears throat> Uh, so we started looking into uh, how to make this uh, an actual migration. And uh, of course, we needed this to, uh, to be uh, done in place without any downtime. And uh, if possible, we didn't want uh, the application team to even notice something was going on. So uh, first obvious step was to make sure that we were not uh, provisioning uh, legacy volumes anymore. So we, uh, we made sure that the CSI storage classes were the default ones. And uh, then after some testing, uh, we realized that it was not an issue to have mixed stateful sets. So meaning that <clears throat> we could have uh, stateful sets both with uh, entry volumes and uh, CSI ones. So we decided uh, to replace our storage classes in place. So taking the, the entry storage classes and uh, turning them into their CSI equivalent. <clears throat> Uh, then we had to uh, take care of the volumes objects themselves. So uh, we wanted to go from the, what you can see on the left to the one on the right. Uh, so actually, there was already code written for that, the code that was uh, used by the CSI migration process uh, in a CSI translation lib. <clears throat> the problem uh, was that you can't change the, the volume specs. Uh, it's an immutable object. So the API server will uh, reject your changes. So we thought, how, how can we uh, work around that? So uh, first idea was to uh, uh, 
uh, patch the, the objects themselves into a etcd backing store. Um, so we thought that maybe uh, it was uh, very hacky and uh, also we were not sure about uh, possible race conditions, uh, the interactions with uh, the different caches of uh, all the Kubernetes components. So uh, we thought that maybe uh, it's better to just patch the API server to allow the modification at the API server level and that's where uh, this operation will be just like any other uh, update operation on an object. Uh, and it will like do all the necessary check to avoid the race condition. So <clears throat> the patch itself, uh, yeah, it's very, uh, very small actually. It's just like commenting out seven lines of code. So just like basically uh, removing the, the equality check uh, in the API server. <clears throat> and so now we had to integrate this uh, properly to, to run the, the migration safely on our, on our fleet. So the migration tool implementation, uh, very straightforward. Uh, we had to connect to a, a patch API server, loop on all the entry volumes we had, use a transition lib, uh, turn them into CSI volumes, and then persist the changes. Uh, so how does it look like? So yeah, the API server uh, connected to the, your etcd backing store. Uh, we deploy a patch API server pod. Uh, we make sure that it's not part of the, of the regular API server pool uh, to uh, <clears throat> make sure that the, the only client is our migration tool. And the migration tool will uh, loop, uh, through, loop on uh, all the entry volumes, uh, translate them into CSI ones, and then persist the changes. And now you can tear down everything and uh, the migration is done. Well, uh, not so fast. <clears throat> Uh, we wanted to use a new snapshot feature then, uh, but it was still failing on GCP. But why? <clears throat> uh, when we had a closer look uh, at uh, the results of our translation, uh, you can see that there was a small difference uh, in the volume handle. Uh, instead of having the correct project, we had an unspecified, like basically a, a placeholder. And uh, so it was making the, the volume handle invalid and uh, it was preventing any operation to be successful, uh, including the snapshot ones. So we were kind of back to square one. <coughs> so <coughs> looking uh, at the entry plugin interface in the translation lib, uh, we saw this, uh, this method called repair volume handle. Uh, it was only implemented for GC persistent disk, so it didn't look very uh, nice, but uh, we had broken the volume handle, so why not repair it? So we uh, added this step in a modified script and uh, run it on an experiment cluster, and then, boom, uh, we got an avalanche of detached events uh, while the pods were running, so it was a catastrophe, like uh, all the pods couldn't access their disk anymore. So it turned out there was a small side effect calling that method. So uh, if you look at uh, the volumes uh, we had attached now uh, to a node, we had actually duplicates. Uh, there was the unspecified one and the one with the correct project. So it had two consequences. Uh, when a pod was rescheduled, uh, unmounting the volume twice was uh, causing errors and the, the pod was stuck in terminating. And on a Q Kubernetes control manager restart, uh, while trying to reconciliate the, the state, uh, it was uh, detaching all the volumes. So we have the repair volume handle fixed that allows us to create snapshots. However, it doesn't work as we expect. Uh, so let's embark on a new journey to fix the fix. So first, let me get back to how CSI works. Um, well, I lied earlier. It's just a bit more complicated than what I explained here. So let me get back to square one. Um, we have the controller manager inside the, the cluster that will create a pod and a PVC in etcd. Once it's created, there is a CSI component called the CSI provisioner that watches for those PVCs, and what it, once it notices one, it will call the CSI driver, which in turn will call the cloud provider to create uh, a volume inside the cloud provider. Once the volume is created, the CSI, CSI provisioner will create the CSI PV inside etcd, and will link it to the cloud provider volume. Then the pod can get scheduled on a node by the scheduler, and on the node where the pod is scheduled, there is a kubelet that uh, know that there is a pod that needs to be here. And we'll, since the pod needs access to a volume, the kubelet will create a volume attachment object inside etcd. This volume attachment is just a way for the kubelet to ask for one volume to be attached to one particular node. And there is another CSI component called the CSI attacher 
that watches for those, those volume attachments objects. And once it, once it notices one, it calls the CSI driver, which calls the cloud provider to attach the volume to the node. When the volume is there, the kubelet creates the pod and calls the CSI node component present on every node to mount the volume inside the pod. And there we have it, like a more compl complete, complete working of, C of CSI. But what is the role of the unspecified that we saw earlier in all this working? Well, uh, when a PV gets processed by some of the components in the cluster, namely the kubelet or controller manager, the, those components have an, a local cache uh, where they store like the, the state of the cluster and the key they use to store the volumes inside the, uh, the, the cluster is called the unique volume name and it is just a concatenation of the driver name and the volume handle name. So in a CSI PV, we have a CSI driver with a the CSI volume handle and so it gets stored inside the cache. Everything is fine. But then we have an entry PV. An entry PV does not have uh, a driver or a volume handle in their spec. So the kubelet and controller manager need to call the same CSI trans translation lib that we used to translate uh, in memory the spec from entry to CSI, but they don't use the repair volume handle that we did. In that case, we store the, um, in the cache with the unspecified. And when we run our own migration script, so we, we change the entry PV to be CSI, we now have a proper CSI spec, and it means that we have another volumes that appears inside the cache, because the key is different. So from the point of view of the kubelet and, every, and, and the other components, we have two unique volumes, which are actually the same PV behind the scene. And this is our issue. So we have a solution for this. Uh, well, we thought maybe we could try to hack some stuff somewhere and fix it. So if we take a look at the, all the components present inside uh, the workings of CSI and get rid of all the components that don't, we, we don't really care about right now or we cannot act on, well, we are left with the three CSI components as well as the kubelet and controller manager. Ideally, we'd like to avoid patching uh, the kubelet and controller manager because it will take a long time to roll out. Remember, we have like hundreds of thousands of nodes. We have multiple versions of Kubernetes in our cluster, so we, we would need to backport uh, the fix in, in every version. And we had already patched the API server so we, we were like, okay, maybe if we can try to avoid patching another Kubernetes core component, just to avoid some unintended side effects, could be a good idea. So we embarked on trying to patch the CSI components, and it didn't work, unfortunately. But why? Well, uh, we took a, a deeper dive into how uh, a volume is managed on a node by the kubelet when there is a pod that, that needs one. And I'm not gonna go too in depth here because uh, it would take a long time, but what is important is this part. It's like what happens when uh, a pod gets terminated and what does the, 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 the kubelet do to get rid of the volumes? And this part is done once for every volume present inside the cache of the kubelet. So in our situation, we have two volumes in the cache, and we have this host file system on the, on the host. And so the, the kubelet will try to read the pod volume data file to get rid of the first volume, which is called the voltdata.json, and it's just like some metadata on the volume. Then the um, node plugin will unmount the volume, removing the volume content, do some basic cleanup on the mount directory, and finally, the kubelet can get rid of the vault data.json and the volume directory. And we can get rid of one of the volume in the cache. Nice. But then we move on to the second volume and try to read the pod volume data file, which does not exist anymore. 
So at this point, the kubelet goes into like an infinite error loop trying to read the file, but it cannot, and the pod gets stuck in terminating. So at this point, we were kind of stuck because we don't want to patch the kubelet in control manager, or we'd like to try and avoid it. And the other components, but patching the other components don't, doesn't work because they don't act at the right moment in the call stack when trying to unmount a volume. So at this point, we were like, okay, maybe we could ask some folks at GCP because you know it's a GCP-only issue. Maybe they have an idea on how we can fix it easily. Unfortunately, they had the same issue as us. So they were like, ah, that's annoying. But one interesting thing that came out of the meetings with GCP is that maybe, maybe we can do something if we migrate the volume while the pods are not present on nodes. Because if we are not on a node, it means that the kubelet cache does not matter anymore because, well, no node, no kubelet. And the controller manager cache is not an issue because the, our issue with the controller manager was that it was trying to detach volume from nodes where the pods were running on them. So if we're not on a node anymore, it does not matter. But then how we, can we not have pods present on nodes? Well, it turns out it happens naturally when we roll out a pod. And it's fairly easy to catch this situation using an admission webhook. So we came up with this solution where we have um, a usual working of our cluster with an API server and everything. And we deploy in this cluster an admission webhook with uh, the patched API server. The admission webhook will watch for pod creation events, which happens when we start a rollout. Then we uh, roll out a, a pod using like a stateful set or, de or deployment. And it's important here to deny the recreation of the pod while the volume is still present on the node. Otherwise, you could have like some kind of race condition where the pod gets recreated, gets rescheduled on the same node, and then you have a race condition with the kubelet trying to detach the volume from the previous pod and trying to reattach the volume of the new pod, and it breaks. So then you wait for the CSI components to get rid of the volume, and once it's done, the control manager can recreate the pod. It goes through the admission webhook, where we call our patched API server to migrate in place the entry PV to CSI. And then the, the pod gets, re, gets recreated and scheduled on the node with its volume, and everything is fine. Our migration is done. So yeah, to put it in a nutshell, so we went from uh, uh, starting with having uh, no CSI support at all, so we uh, deployed all the various CSI drivers, and then we went through this uh, official CSI migration, uh, quickly realizing that it was not going to do it for us. So <clears throat> we evaluated different solutions and uh, eventually uh, came up with this, uh, this migration. Along the way, we had to work around a, a couple of issues. And uh, so in the end, our custom migration process took us uh, six months, and uh, it didn't cause any incidents. So if you need to, to go down that road uh, or are just curious, uh, we made the, the code available on GitHub. So what did we learn? Uh, it's okay sometimes to take a, an orthodox path uh, as long as you make sure you mitigate the risk uh, as much as you can. And also make sure you discuss with your team and uh, everyone is on board. Uh, you don't want people to uh, learn about your uh, innovative approach uh, during an outage that uh, was caused by it. Uh, also, uh, the more you go down on the stack, uh, the more you're going to have to deal with uh, some uh, cloud provider specifics or implementation details. Uh, the repair volume handle is a, a pretty good example of this. And also, there is a lot of value uh, in uh, talking to other people in the community. Uh, when we started this, uh, we saw that maybe we're the only fools trying to, to do that. And uh, talking to folks at Google, we realized they, were, they had the same kind of issues. And uh, by presenting uh, uh, our problem, it was a, a good way to take a few step backs, and uh, it led us to find a, a working solution. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have uh, any uh, feedback or question, now is the time.
Thank you for the presentation. I think this is like hackery at its finest. Uh, so what do you think like this would be easier, for example, in the, with the AWS and EBS in general? Because I think you can like create a CSI volume, but from the snapshots, so from the actual like snapshot in the cloud provider. And would it be like an easier approach to just like have like unmount the pod, like have like uh, a new C well, not, not, not even unmount, but basically create it from, create a new volume from the snapshot, but it's gonna be like a native CSI, CSI volume. Yeah, I think it's the recommended way of doing it, but uh, at our scale, it's just not possible. I mean, uh, if you do that, you have to involve the, the application teams and uh, they have to do the, the process or you have to do, do it for them. But I mean, it's gonna, uh, you're gonna have to have some kind of uh, yeah, meeting with them and uh, coordination. And, uh, and in the end, we just wanna change some metadata. I mean, there is no, no real reason to uh, snapshot the data to put the same data uh, in another object. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have one question uh, regarding the process that you went through. So did you, like, uh, what guarantee that you have, like, resolved all the issues? What's uh, the process that you went through uh, for the testing? Um, that's it. So, well, so, um, honestly, it was a fairly manual process for us because we, well, what we did test was like trying to migrate a few volumes in experimental clusters, trying to check that the features were, were working and obviously that the, um, after weeks there was, no, there was no issue with the volume and that's how we noticed the avalanche of detached events that we had. Uh, so we are not sure that it will never be a, an issue but like now the migration has been done for four months in our clusters and in our production clusters and we did not see anything. So we are fairly confident that it's okay right now. 